Dr. Ehrman maintains that we can never say that a miracle like the resurrection probably occurred because miracles by their very nature are inherently improbable. Now, despite what he says, this argument is nothing new. It was already propounded in the 18th century by David Hume in his essay of miracles. Dr. Ehrman's argument is just a warmed over version of Hume's reasoning. Now, what do contemporary <coughs> philosophers think of Hume's argument against the identification of miracles? Well, let me introduce you to another Ehrman, John Ehrman, professor of philosophy of science at the University of Pittsburgh. This professor Ehrman is not a Christian. Uh, in fact, he's an agnostic. He doesn't even believe God exists. Nevertheless, you see what he thinks of Hume's argument. It's not merely a failure, it is an abject failure. That is to say, it is demonstrably, irremediably, hopelessly fallacious. Let me explain why. When we talk about the probability of some event or hypothesis A, that probability is always relative to a body of background information B. So we speak of the probability of A on B, or of A with respect to B. So, in order to figure out the probability of the resurrection, let B stand for our background knowledge of the world apart from any evidence for the resurrection. Let E stand for the specific evidence for Jesus' resurrection, the empty tomb, post-mortem appearances, and so on. Finally, let R stand for Jesus' resurrection. Now, what we want to figure out is the probability of Jesus' resurrection given our background knowledge of the world and the specific evidence in this case. Now, probability theorists have developed a very complicated formula for calculating probabilities like this, and I'm going to walk you through it one step at a time so that you'll be able to get it. The first factor that we need to consider is the probability of the resurrection on the background knowledge alone. This is called the intrinsic probability of the resurrection. It tells how probable the resurrection is given our general knowledge of the world. Next, we multiply that by the probability of the evidence given our background knowledge and the resurrection. This is called the explanatory power of the resurrection hypothesis. It tells how probable the resurrection makes the evidence of the empty tomb and so forth. And these two factors form the numerator of this ratio. Now, below the line, just reproduce the numerator. Just move everything above the line down below the line. Finally, we add to that the product of two more factors. The intrinsic probability that Jesus did not rise from the dead, plus, or rather, times the explanatory power of the hypothesis of no resurrection. And basically, this is the intrinsic uh, probability and explanatory power of all the naturalistic explanations of Jesus' resurrection. So, the probability of Jesus' resurrection relative to our background information and the specific evidence is equal to this complicated ratio. And now we're ready to see exactly where Dr. Ehrman's error lies. So, in the grand tradition of Hume's abject failure, I give you Ehrman's egregious error. He says, because historians can only establish what probably happened, and a miracle of this nature is highly improbable, the historian cannot say it probably occurred. In other words, in calculating the probability of Jesus' resurrection, the only factor he considers is the intrinsic probability of the resurrection alone. He just ignores all the other factors, and that's just mathematically fallacious. The probability of the resurrection could still be very high, even though the probability of R on B alone is terribly low. Specifically, Dr. Ehrman just ignores the crucial factors of the probability of the naturalistic alternatives to the resurrection. If these are sufficiently low, they outbalance any intrinsic improbability of the resurrection hypothesis. And we can see this by looking at the general form of the probability calculus. It has the form of x over x plus y because the numerator is reproduced in the denominator. Now notice that as y tends towards zero, the value of this ratio tends toward one, which in probability theory means absolute certainty. So what is really crucial here is the probability of y 
which represents the intrinsic probability and explanatory power of those naturalistic alternatives to Jesus' resurrection. So Dr. Ehrman can't just ignore these or present fanciful hypotheses. In order to uh, explain that the resurrection is improbable, he needs not only to tear down all of the evidence for the resurrection, but he needs to erect a positive case of his own in favor of some naturalistic alternatives. But that's not all. Notice that Dr. Ehrman just assumes that the probability of the resurrection on our background knowledge is very low. But here I think he's confused. What, after all, is the resurrection hypothesis? It is the hypothesis that Jesus rose supernaturally from the dead. It is not the hypothesis that Jesus rose naturally from the dead. That Jesus rose naturally from the dead is fantastically improbable. But I see no reason whatsoever to think that it is improbable that God raised Jesus from the dead. In order to show that that hypothesis is improbable, you'd have to show that God's existence is improbable. But Dr. Ehrman says that the historian cannot say anything about God. Therefore, he cannot say that God's existence is improbable. But if he can't say that, neither can he say that the resurrection of Jesus is improbable. So Dr. Ehrman's position is literally self-refuting. But it gets even worse. There's another version of Dr. Ehrman's objection which is even more obviously fallacious than Ehrman's egregious error, uh, and I call it Bart's blunder. Here it is. Since historians can establish only what probably happened in the past, they cannot show that miracles happen since this would involve a contradiction, that the most improbable event is the most probable. In truth, there's no contradiction here at all because we're talking about two different probabilities. The probability of the resurrection on the background knowledge and the evidence versus the probability of the resurrection on the background knowledge alone. And it's not at all surprising that the first may be very high while the second might be very low. There's no contradiction at all. So in sum, Dr. Ehrman's fundamental objection against the resurrection hypothesis is demonstrably fallacious. 